Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I am Brahim Aude. Blessed are the peacemakers. And this theme uh, for tonight uh, is uh, inspired by the visit of uh, Sis and Jerry Levin from the Christian Peacemakers uh, teams um, in Palestine and uh, in Iraq as well. And we have three guests to discuss uh, the um, Christian Peacemakers team and uh, why the peacemakers are blessed. Reverend uh, Barbara Grace Ripple, thank you for coming. Uh, George Yudis, uh, member Jewish Voice for Peace and uh, member also for Friends of Sabil. And Ramses Lutfi, uh, member of Friends of Sabil. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Uh, so um, I know that uh, you uh, have uh, recently returned from uh, Palestine, Israel. And I also know, George, uh, you went uh, at least two, three times uh, to Palestine, twice. Israel, twice. Yeah. And Ramses, I know maybe in the old days you visited Palestine. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. and I was born in Palestine. So we have something uh, in common right there. We've always been there at <laughs> one point or another. So uh, could you uh, please uh, say something about your trip because it's the most recent and uh, why you went there and uh, the question of peace and war in that part of the world? Mm, thank you very much, Brahim. It was the lifelong dream that I had to go to the Holy Land. As a United Methodist pastor, even before I was a pastor, I always wanted to go and see the land where Jesus was born and raised and lived in the land of the Bible, Old and New Testaments. And uh, I finally, our General Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church advertised a trip that was prepared by uh, the Reverend Sandra Olwine. Mm -hmm. She's a United Methodist clergywoman and a missionary in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And so I thought, this is the time. This is when I have to go. And so it was a 10-day immersion uh, for education and advocacy for the Palestinian people that she works with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really blessed oh, to be able to go. Great, yeah. And uh, I also know that uh, through your efforts and efforts of uh, Friends of Sabil, George uh, in particular, uh, that the Levins uh, were, were here. They just left this morning, I'm told, yes. uh, after like about a week here. Yes. And uh, so they did have some uh, time here uh, to talk with people. And uh, they, in fact, lectured at uh, the University also of Hawaii. Um, that was, I think, on uh, Tuesday? Thursday. Uh, thir Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Thursday, yeah. Thursday. Right. Actually, <coughs> yeah. it was a week ago tonight that oh. we met them at the airport. All right. What a week. Yeah. What a yeah. week it was. Okay. <laughs> so it's good that uh, they, uh, they uh, were here in Hawaii and people in Hawaii were able to listen to them mm -hmm. and so on. And they've been engaged in uh, questions of uh, war and peace uh, in that part of the world. So what uh, I did, uh, we taped the entire show that they had um, uh, at the University of Hawaii, and we have some segments from it. So Sis Levin, uh, she's uh, been uh, teaching uh, about peace in uh, Bethlehem, uh, which is mm -hmm. um, an appropriate right. place to teach mm -hmm. peace. Uh, and then uh, we can like watch um, a segment uh, from Sis Levin, and then we can talk about it. It's a short one. has become the number one health problem among children primarily everywhere. Just turn on the TV. Violence has become this problem. We're not willing to admit it and we're not really anxious to face it. So we're not getting at how to change that. I think we will because the medical world has said uh, the only way to prevent this is through education for peace. And people listen to doctors. <laughs> they don't listen to teachers. But it has become an epidemic everywhere. And in this model that I'm going to share with you, we're living with violence every day. Yeah, so um, we were talking earlier, and uh, you were mentioning that uh, <clears throat> at first, perhaps you were concerned about being there, et cetera. So what are some of your, <laughs> of your experiences? Uh, in Palestine. Well, Israel. I was there for 10 days, staying in Bethlehem and then traveling throughout the West Bank and parts of Israel. And I found the most wonderful, beautiful people. 
but I also learned about the violence with which they have to live, the violence of persons who uh, are just totally being oppressed by others living in their land. And uh, I, I really admire what Sis is doing in Bethlehem because the children have so little and it is easy for them to be angry. Uh, they have seen family members killed. They have uh, seen, I mean, the unemployment rate in some places is 80%. Um, in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, within the last few years, they have actually had sometimes up to 40 days of a 24-hour curfew for all persons. No jobs, they can't go to work, they can't go to school. All they can do is stay in their home 24 hours a day several days at a time, but one time it was 40 days, 40 unholy days. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that's how long Jesus spent in the wilderness. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, really. And to yeah. read the diaries of some of these teenage girls who are Christian, who are in a Catholic girls' school, and who uh, tell about what this is like and how they wish that they could live like other girls in other parts of the world. Good. Uh, George, you also like uh, visited uh, Israel, Palestine, and so could you say something about your experiences there? Well, I went, I guess, for two reasons: uh, for a reality check. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes seeing things personally has a way of uh, raising additional questions or verifying prior impressions. And I also went. Uh, I wanted to show some solidarity with the Palestinians uh, because I, I don't believe that we would see any of the violence going on if not for the illegal occupation. I mean, Israel legally has no business being there according to their own legal counsel, uh, according to studies which have been done and according to almost every international institution. So I went there for those two primary purposes and perhaps unlike Barbara's trip, Ours was talking to groups from many sides, but I came away with an overwhelming impression that the biggest problem is, it's kind of like, you know, hey, stupid, it's the occupation. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> we were in Hebron. We were in Hebron uh, the, uh, the night that uh, Arafat died. Oh. People said, oh, weren't you afraid? We were not, the only people to be afraid of were the Israeli Defense Forces. As a matter of fact, the sum in our party of 11 uh, spent the night at an apartment and there was one of these typical nighttime raids by the IDF where they took two Palestinians, stripped them naked, used them as human shields. And one, one, one of our group had experienced the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, and she thought she was back in the same type of situation, except, yeah. yeah, but this is a, this is an almost nightly thing for the mm -hmm. Palestinians. And we did meet with the uh, members of the Christian Peacemaker team when we saw the work that they do. And they do very difficult work, mm -hmm. because they're there between the uh, radical Zionist settlers uh, there are a number of ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, Jewish settlements in the heart of Hebron, uh, and they have been chasing out the Palestinians, making life uh, unlivable for them in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a const constant conflict going on. Uh, the Palestinian children can't get to school without running gauntlets. And so we met with the peacemakers and we saw exactly what they do. And, and they try to, 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 to just make sure that nobody's being killed and, and wounded. Mm -hmm. uh, so they walk the children to school. When there's a conflict, they get in between. They try to get the Israeli Defense Forces to just do their job, mm -hmm. which they don't usually do. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, a, if an Israeli is being hassled, the Israeli Defense Forces are there on the spot and problem solved. Mm -hmm. If the Palestinians are being hassled in any way or fashion, uh, you know, yeah. uh, the bus may come tomorrow. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> That's the, um, you we know. We experienced the, the same yeah. thing, by the way, mm -hmm. picking olives. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went mm -hmm. to the village to pick olives uh, with rabbis for human rights. And um, do I have a second here? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, 
there was a, an outpost, uh, mm -hmm. a, an Israeli outpost, all of which have been determined to be illegal by the uh, Israeli government's own reports. Mm -hmm. uh, illegal under Israeli law. Mm -hmm. But there's this outpost, it's a few trailers with a couple of with settlers, and they're very aggressive. And he, then you have the olive fields down below, the slopes mm -hmm. covered with the olive trees. And you go to pick olives, and the settlers come out and cause problems. So the, the Israeli Defense Forces come and they say, well, we're here to avoid trouble. So you Palestinians, you can't pick from those three fields because we don't want you coming close to the settlers. This is how they protect mm -hmm. the Palestinians by making their own fields off limits to mm -hmm. them. And this is the livelihood. And, and, and we were in is exactly this situation. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to read about it, but when you see it, how it's, it's quite ludicrous. And, and so once again, how does the Israeli Defense Forces do their job? Mm -hmm. uh, do they, do they administer the law objectively? Far from it. Yeah, of course, because they are like uh, an occupation force, mm -hmm. a colonial force, so, yeah. And in this situation, it was somebody like Rabbi Arik Asherman mm -hmm. from Rabbis for Human mm -hmm. Rights that was trying to play the same role as the members of the Christian Peacemaker mm -hmm. team in Hebron. And we found out from Jerry and Sis when they were here, and I was also informed when I was there, that they work very closely together. Mm -hmm. The Israeli human rights organizations mm -hmm. work closely with the Christian peacemaker teams and Palestinian human mm -hmm. rights organizations. Mm -hmm. They're all after the same thing. Right. Right. So the, the, this is uh, very important things to to bring up. It's not only like uh, Christian peacemakers teams, but also Palestinian human rights organization, also Israeli human rights yes, organizations, Israeli, yeah. and there are all kinds of uh, Israeli organizations that are helping and out. And, and the international, yeah, organiza yes. international yeah, and international, of course, groups, yeah. Yes. yeah, ISM, for instance, to be sure. And some of the CPT some of the groups others, are yeah. not Israeli or Palestinian, like the Ayush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I mean, yes. this is. And this has been a problem for the IDF sometimes mm -hmm. because the IDF used to just break heads mm -hmm. when the Palestinians <laughs> tried to participate in civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. That was an avenue that was not open to them, mm -hmm. as you, we yeah. all well know. Mm -hmm. But when the Israelis joined together with them in organizations like the Ayush, mm -hmm. and they go out and demonstrate, well, it becomes more difficult Absolutely. for the IDF because then they might be breaking the heads of Jewish protesters, so which they have done. Right. But they're more hesitant yeah, they to have, do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They will probably do more of that. <laughs> uh, we, we would wish it weren't so, but yeah. So uh, before we go uh, to Ramses, I'd like to also go to the segment uh, from Sis, uh, actually, and it's about uh, minute 20, and she talks about uh, university students and education for peace. Uh, you would wonder sometimes. Um, if you have time to like get educated and uh, you know pursue peace uh, mm -hmm. in such a violent environment, but here's this. Yeah. University students. In this case, this was a tough one again uh, for me. In all humility, I tell you, you try this mission, and you will get humility. Uh, this was at Janine. I don't know how many of you know the story of Janine. This was almost three years ago and the Israeli army had gone into Janine and done what was called a massacre. There's not a student in this room that didn't lose a member of their family or have their house bulldozed. Uh, the Arab American University at Janine wanted to work on education for peace. And so we went up and lived with them and worked on it. And it was a remarkable experience, especially for me as an American. What, what can I tell you about peace when I live in the most violent country on earth? It is simply this. We are the family of Abraham. There is true truth. It is working. It will work. We've got to work at it. And we've got to be courageous enough to put down our differences so here's a message of peace as well. Uh, so uh, Ramses, uh, you've heard, um, uh, you know, in fact, you've heard uh, the Levins when uh, yes, they yeah. were here. So yeah. Yeah, any further comments on what well, we have actually, been discussing? Actually, I consider that the, these groups that are working for peace in Israel, Palestine, are the epitome of goodness. I mean, you, you can't see 
anybody that just doesn't only object to oppression and and uh, suppression of people and taking away people's rights and and encroaching on their human rights and all that and just not only talking about this and criticizing it but going and doing something to try and stop this mm -hmm. and of course we have seen examples of this several times and some of them of course put themselves in great dangers like Rachel Corey when mm -hmm. she stood there sacrificing herself against an armed bulldozer that was demolishing a house for the Palestinian yeah, there were people but, in there. Yes, yeah. people there inside, yeah. and the, 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 the bulldozer was going to demolish the house with, with the people in it. So she stood there, and she wouldn't budge, and the bulldozer killed her. Mm -hmm. So th this is the epitome of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Actually, this shows you that goodness is all over the world in some people, mm -hmm. and badness is also all over the world in other people. Mm -hmm. But the ones that really sort of object to badness are the ones that go, the ones that go and put themselves in danger to try and stop these bad acts. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the Palestinian-Israeli strife has lasted too long. And it's about time that the world woke up mm -hmm. to realize that this is not a good thing to continue. It has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. Not any time in the modern era or mo modern history has a problem of this size continued unabated as this, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it, it's the, the fantastic thing is that most people in the United States don't seem to hear about it. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the role of the media in America. Mm -hmm. They are completely wiping out any news mm -hmm. about this area. The, what's, what's actually happening, mm -hmm. what's actually happening is not told to the people and also the people are not don't seem to be interested in knowing, mm -hmm. as if they are in denial. Mm -hmm. They don't want to, yeah. to hear about problems. That's right. But uh, we were talking earlier um, about, like, why should people uh, in the United States, uh, or in Hawaii for that matter, uh, worry about what's going on there? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> Yes, that's true. Uh, I mean, we're half a world away. It's 12 hours difference. And we are half a world away, and it seems that you know, we have enough problems of our own here in Hawaii, so why should we worry about s these problems so far away? And I hear, I hear things said such as, well, the Arabs and Jews have always been at it, the, the Muslims and Jews, you know, it's historical, it's biblical, it's all this, and I do not believe any of that. Um, I think those are all excuses that are given, but uh, for justifying things that should not be. The reasons that we should be involved and should be aware and should care come partly because for those of us of the three major monolithic faiths, monotheistic faiths, Mono monotheistic, yeah. monotheistic mm. faiths. But not monolithic. <laughs> not monolithic, not monolithic, <laughs> monotheistic. Um, but anyhow, meaning for some people, um, faith that has one God. Um, you know, there is that, I mean, you know, that, that we believe that God put us here to care for the earth and to care for all people, all people, all people. Mm -hmm. um, but besides that, one of the things that I learned when I was there and that just absolutely, I really learned a lot about the involvement of our own government. I mean, I would, I would look at the situation there. I would look at the Palestinian homes that were being destroyed. I would look at the settlement homes that were being built, even as the news media said how they were being torn down, and I saw them right in front of me being built, you know, and I thought, you know, that Israeli government, they really are on the wrong track. Then I had to learn about how our government 
was supporting every single thing that was happening there. How we are pouring billions of dollars, how we have given so much money and military means. Um, a former Israeli military officer in the Special Forces thanked those of us from the United States um, for the wonderful weapons that we had given him that he learned how to use. And then I found out that the Israelis even were selling them to the pa Palestinians. But, you know, I thought, what are we doing supporting the wall, the separation wall? What are we doing supporting these control towers that, that keep people from being able to even visit their own relatives? You know, what are we doing? Why are we allowing this to be supported with our tax money? You know, and so I think we need to be involved because it is, it is our money. Right now we're paying our taxes and I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a large percent. I was told that something like 45% of all of our foreign aid money goes to Israel. Oh, it's 40%, it varies. 40%, okay. Because yes. it's hard to get a total grip, but somewhere total. between three and five billion a year. Mm -hmm. Three to five billion a year. That's to apart Israel. from the, 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 uh, the uh, loan guarantees, mm -hmm. which is 10 billion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I mean, there's a reason why we should care oh. about uh, what's happening because you might uh, end up fighting another war that's over right. there. It's hmm. very okay, and then uh, the young people from here will have to go. I mean, well, I understand so. that Israel is the fourth most prolific nuclear weapon country, what, yes, what is the proper yes, term yeah. for this? The fourth nuclear power. The fourth nuclear power in the world, mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And we are right there behind it. I mean, we're in front of them as far as nuclear. Who's the first? Yeah. Who's the first? And that is <laughs> but, but there we are supporting them and telling other countries. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, actually, uh, we have uh, Jim from Kauai on the line. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, you're on the air. Good evening. Good evening, Barbara Grace. Hello, Jim. And Ramses and your wife, Judy. Um, good to see you. I know Ramses. Um, uh, Barbara Grace, uh, I think you know where I'm going to come from. Uh, um, what I really find disturbing is how can we go about achieving peace in the Middle East between the Israelis and the Palestinians when Hamas will not recognize Israel's right to exist? Um, you know, they want them obliterated off of the face of the earth. How in the world are we going to bring these two sides together as long as the Palestinians maintain um, that um, stance? Okay, good question, Jim. And uh, when I was there on the election day, January 25th, I went to three of the polling places and I talked with several persons from Hamas, needing translation for some of them, but um, I found them to be people who really want peace. I know that goes against everything that we hear, Jim. I know that there are many people who immediately, I mean, when I came back and saw that every time Hamas was used, it was militant, militant Hamas, militant Hamas, like Palestinian terrorist. Um, I find that what Hamas wants is what all of us want for our countries, for our families, for our children. They would like an end to the occupation. They would like a recognition that Palestine and Palestinians do exist, which Israeli, even Israeli leaders have said that there is no such thing as a Palestinian uh, people. That's Golda Meir. Golda yeah. Meir, yeah. Golda Meir herself. Yeah. Um, I, a quote that I have from Terry Arnold, who's um, actually, I learned as a senior foreign uh, service officer, he retired, uh, working with the U.S. Department of State. But anyhow, um, he said that it's curious that while so many Western governments are demanding in unison that the new Palestinian leadership must recognize Israel, renounce violence, and honor all agreements with Israel, not a single one of them has thought to suggest, let alone demand, that Israel should recognize Palestine, renounce violence, and honor all agreements with Palestine. Mm -hmm. I think I think George can fill in more, and maybe Ramses yeah, also. Sure. Yeah. But uh, about yeah. the fact that um, Hamas is willing to recognize an Israeli state that abides by the laws and rules of the United Nations and of the United States and major governments, the things that we have said 
going back to the original borders and taking out all the settlements and allowing Palestinians to live in peace? No. Would you uh, like any to? more on that, George? <laughs> well, I certainly agree with most of what Barbara says, but the other thing is that they are the duly, Hamas is the duly elected representatives of the Palestinian people now. What do we tell people about the process of democracy mm -hmm. when we say, well, this is who you want to represent you and we're not even going to talk to them? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very strange that we don't even, see, Hamas is willing to talk. Mm -hmm. If somebody's willing to talk, that's an alternative to violence. Mm -hmm. That's an alternative to killing. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you talk, you find areas of commonality. But I think the real problem is here Israel does not want to negotiate with a tough negotiating partner. Mm -hmm. They stonewalled the PLO for decades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the PLO was desperately seeking anything, and, and mm -hmm. uh, there was all the corruption and all that. Well, now they're faced with somebody who seems to be a little bit more Akamai mm -hmm. than the PLO. Mm -hmm. The PLO, let's not forget, had that type of thing in their charter also mm -hmm. about yeah. wiping Israel off the face of the earth. That, that changed, there, there is a way of, mm. you know, but unless you talk to somebody, um, yeah. there's no hope. And with what the Palestinians are gonna wipe out Israel off the face of the <laughs> earth? <laughs> <They're> <laughs> stone. Yes. Yes. Stone. The, the great asymmetry yeah. Yeah. between Israel, yeah. the fourth strongest army in right. the world, uh -huh. and a, 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 a population a people mm -hmm. who are not armed mm -hmm. and have no army mm -hmm. and even a, a very weak police force that can't keep peace. Mm -hmm. it's, what, what kind of asymmetry is that? Yeah. So, so Hamas is going to wipe off Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it, it, yeah. the, one, the additional lies mm -hmm. that are being mm -hmm. fed into the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, what I, I want to, to, to remind everybody is that Israel doesn't want to admit that there are Palestinians, as Barbara said, mm -hmm. they deny the, the existence of the Palestinians all through the, this, these problems. And, and also, Israel is the only country in the world, the only state in the world that doesn't have a map of its mm -hmm. borders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have a constitution. Mm -hmm. And when they are, they are not ad admitting or recognizing the Palestinians and their borders, what, uh, what is the Palestinian state going to be? Mm -hmm. And they don't have a limited borders to themselves. So Hamas is saying, if you don't ac accept our existence, mm -hmm. if you don't recognize Palestine, how can we recognize you? Yeah. How can I recognize a, 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 an Israeli state that does not have borders? Mm -hmm. Tell us, give us a map. Yeah, not that uh, we are enamored of Hamas, but you know, you mm -hmm. call a spade a spade and speak the truth, you know, about mm -hmm. those kinds of issues. Anyway, what I want to do now, uh, and then we can continue the discussion, is go to another segment from uh, Jerry uh, Levin this time. It's uh, about two and a half minutes, but it's worth uh, uh, us watching it, so. Palestinians today I assure you, is worse than yesterday. And tomorrow will be worse than today. And the day after tomorrow will be even worse than that. And that's why my wife, Sis, and I, and probably most international nonviolent peace activists, such as Christian Peacemaker Team, and many Israeli Jewish nonviolent peace activists and Jews like them from elsewhere in the world, all of us feel driven to spend most of our time in occupied Palestine. Now we go there in order to get in the way of the violent deprivation of Palestinian life and limb and theft of property there. And we also go there in order to get in the way of the heartbreaking waste of Israeli life and limb that has been lost because of militant Zionism's dreadful pursuit of conquest and colonization. And also 
de facto ethnic supremacy. Now, tragically, both practices have been conducted for decades. I'm sorry, tragically, both practices have been condoned for decades by a series of United States governments which continue to place a premium, which continue to place a premium on thuggish exclusivist sovereignty over human rights. Every CPT or Christian peacemaker, peacemaker team member who signs on to get in the way of the bloody brutishness of power, do it by accompanying the defenseless, <clears throat> documenting their plight in the violent excesses of oppressive occupation, engaging in collegial nonviolent resistance, and initiating or participating in challenging assertive direct actions of defiance, resolve, and civil disobedience. Yeah, I mean, um, here uh, he is talking about some of the stuff we, we were talking about, uh, but uh, there's a, a picture of the separation wall, um, you know, and uh, some people call it the apartheid wall. Um, and uh, you could see that there was the peace process, and it wasn't misspelled. Uh, it was <laughs> P-I-E-C-E, -E because uh, there's no P-E-A-C-E. -E. Mm. There's only peacemaker teams yeah. over there. Yeah, and uh, not only peacemaker teams, I'm using them as a metaphor, but um, all kinds of uh, organizations, Israeli, mm -hmm. Palestinian, yeah. and others, who, who do that. But uh, these are kind of uh, interesting things, uh, you know, speaking truth to power and standing in the face of power like trying to do something about uh, those kinds of issues, like as we were talking about, mm -hmm. yeah. So any more comments on uh, what uh, Jerry well, was uh, talking well, about? Well, I'd like to, I, I can, I can, I'd like to sort of anticipate some comments of maybe some viewers. Some people say, well, here you're, you're just condemning the Israelis. What about the suicide bombers? Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that the listeners heard that Jerry and Sis's condemnation of that as a way of trying to redress wrongs is just as 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 wrong mm -hmm. as the violence mm -hmm. uh, the, by the official Israeli state or yeah. the unofficial uh, settlers they they say they under they did say they understand mm -hmm. why we have this mm -hmm. but they don't condone it absolutely mm -hmm. and um, so I, I think that's important to recognize that mm -hmm. as peacemakers, they're not just taking one side here mm -hmm. in terms of condemning just the violence of one side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's important to understand uh, because they really do take a nonviolence position mm -hmm. and, and they advocate that it's only through talking, through negotiating, through, through seeking common ground mm -hmm. that that there can be a, any peace. And indeed, we do have experiences. For example, the, the Geneva Accords mm -hmm. uh, of, what is it, two years ago now, mm -hmm. I believe, yeah. two years ago, mm -hmm. but where you had uh, representatives uh, or, or of factions, Palestinian factions and Israeli, and Israeli factions, and these were fairly high-ranking people, mm -hmm. came together with a plan that could have been a good starting point for peace, you know, indicating possible borders. I mean, they, they left some touchy questions uh, undefined, like the right of return. But, but they were making progress along those lines. But what kind of reaction did we have from Israel? Total yeah. ignoring. Uh, and we had an indication from Arafat at the time that, you know, of interest, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there are possibilities, mm -hmm. but those are shunned mm -hmm. by the Israeli government. Yeah, Indeed. under under labor. I'm sorry, under labor uh, because it was Barak uh, right. yeah, later, and then uh, under uh, mm. Likud, and uh, now under Kadima, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me, I don't think there is any difference between labor and Kadima or Likud or any of these factions in their great project, mm. their great plan for greater Israel. That means that Israel would be take all the land from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, 
and eventually they get rid of all the Palestinians that are there. And all these steps that they are forced to sort of st stop at are only temporary. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, for example, getting rid of 700,000 uh, uh, Arab, uh, you know, Palestinians uh, in, in, in the 48 war. Mm -hmm. And after that, in the 67 war. Mm -hmm. And after that now, mm -hmm breaking the West Bank into three little entities or Bantu stands yeah. surrounded by a wall. All these are, you know, stopgap mm -hmm. uh, measures on the way to getting rid of all this. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. Um. Um, I, I uh, agree with everything that is being said. Um, I would like to, while we're using these clips from Jerry and Sis, um, I'd like to just put in a few words about Jerry. Sure. Okay. I met Jerry in January in Hebron. He took my small group on a tour through Old Hebron and explained a lot of what we saw and what was going on. But one of the things about Jerry is when you learn his story, and anybody who wants to Google can Google Jerry Levin Beirut. Um, Jerry was CNN bureau chief, mm -hmm. Middle East, uh, was captured as he was walking to work one day, 1984, held hostage 11 and a half months. Mm -hmm. During that time, he was tortured. He was, you know, it was really a rugged time. Up to that point, he was a bureau chief. I mean, he was not a Christian peacemaker. He believed that, you know, people should be punished for what they did and, and you know, get even and all that. However, during that 11 and a half months, there was a transformation. Mm -hmm and coming out of that. The reason I say that is because he does not come at being a Christian peacemaker from a perspective of, I just have always believed in turning the other mm -hmm. cheek. Mm -hmm. He was tortured by Hezbollah. He was, um, you know, almost one year of solitary confinement, mm -hmm. um, not, no contact with family or anything else. And then he came out of that first by forgiving those who had captured him and second, by working the rest of his life to try to bring peace and reconciliation. Yeah. Mm. Good. In fact, uh, we're going to watch uh, another segment from Jerry speaking uh, about good. these mm. things. Yeah. Very good. Well, why this change of heart and mind and soul? Because in captivity, it became clear to me that the absence of nonviolence as a primary motivating force in terms of conduct, human behavior in other words, has been and still is one of the most crucial issues that the world must face up to if humankind is to survive. We all need to face up to it because too many people only give lip service to teachings about nonviolence and just peacemaking. As taught, for instance, by Jesus during his sermons on the Mount and Plain, by their violent antisocial actions, however, these naysayers, it's clear, are doing their best to turn Jesus into an exclusivist, ultranationalist, tribal god of war. And because of these people's antithetical thinking, it is, of course, not coincidental that latter-day apostles of nonviolence and human rights such as Gandhi and King suffered the same fate. Well, thoughts such as those, especially love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, led in time to my identifying what I have since then called the context of my captivity. And that context is the futility of violence. Now I reached that conclusion because of a sudden and new understanding of history. An understanding that led to the further conviction that Violence simply doesn't work. 
And because of that conviction, my wife, Sis, and I have traveled back and forth between the U.S. and the not-so-holy land in order to participate in the struggle against the epical violence there that is making eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth look like the good old days. Yeah, <clears throat> the God of vengeance yeah. <laughs> instead of the God of mercy. You yeah. know? And these are like themes very important uh, in terms of Judaism and so on. Yeah. And so who are you with? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's very important. And uh, any more uh, on that? Because, you know, Jerry was talking about the things uh, George was talking about and right. you. I would really like to speak about Parents Circle. Um, when we were there, we met some young men who are part of what is called the Parents Circle, mm -hmm. even though it's parents. It's a very exclusive group of families about half of them are Jewish and about half of them are Palestinian, Muslim, and Christian. Uh, in order to become part of this group, you have to have had an immediate family member killed in the violence. Mm -hmm. These two young men sat side by side. One of them Israeli, one of them Muslim. The Israeli had been a soldier, had been the um, special forces person, the Israeli man. He talked about his sister who was walking home from school, stopped with her friends at a bookstore, and a suicide bomber detonated. They were all killed. He talked about his anger, his seeking for vengeance, how neighbors came in from all over saying, you've got to have vengeance, you've got to, you know. The other young man spoke up in his stead, and he is a Palestinian, and lived at home with his parents as a small child, um, when at 3 o'clock in the morning, the Israeli soldiers came in searching for something that they didn't find. What they did do is take his eldest brother away for questioning and interrogation. And two days later, the elder brother was allowed to come home, but he was already vomiting blood. It turned out that in their interrogating, um, they evidently did something that severed his liver. And uh, he died two days later. And so the same idea, both of these young men and their families, after grappling with this horror and this, this desire for vengeance and, and, and this anger and the pain, came to that same conclusion, that violence perpetuates more yes. violence, yeah. perpetuates more violence, and as Gandhi said, I believe, um, an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They now speak together, this whole group. They even have a radio station, a radio program, where they speak about the need to reconcile, the need to forgive, the need to work for peace. Mm -hmm. And I... Yeah, no, no one talks about Israeli terrorism on yeah. both levels. Yeah. One is uh, Israeli state terrorism, the other terrorism that uh, you were talking about, uh, which is <coughs> those like nuts, uh, colonialists on the West Bank and uh, before that yeah. Gaza who well, really yeah, are just uh, amazing. Yeah. The settlers, yeah, the settlers they are, yeah. they're, they're, they're yeah. pretty vicious. So. Yeah. Right. Can I add? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously we have all sort of agreed to the fact that violence begets violence. It's a continuous a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that the Palestinians are living under unbearable conditions. Mm -hmm. And this is a deliberate, continuous policy by Israel mm -hmm. to make life unlivable for the Palestinians so they can pack and go. Mm -hmm. They want the land, they don't want the Palestinians. So when you, when you get the, the, the statistics about the ratio of those killed by the, Palesti the by Palestinians and those killed by the IDF and by the settlers, it's more than 3.5% Arabs, are Palestinians, against one Israeli. Mm -hmm. So we, we only hear about uh, 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 suicide bombers and the, the victims of suicide bombers. And uh, we, we forget the pressure and the hopelessness of those people that go and make the, fa the final sacrifice, mm -hmm. kill themselves with their enemies. Mm -hmm. I mean, history, 
is full of this. I'm not condoning it, mm -hmm. but it's a natural result of the pressure under which these people are living. Mm -hmm. And if you th I mean, see the humiliation and demonization they are suffering under the Israeli IDF, mm -hmm. a little kid of, of, of 16 years or 17 years carrying a Kalashnikov and ordering people or, or even women to strip so that they can they can search her. Mm -hmm. People, I mean, women having giving birth at checkpoints, mm -hmm. and and the, the the babies dying mm -hmm. at checkpoints. Mm -hmm. All these pressures, you know, humiliating a father in yeah. front of his kids. Yeah. So all the, this is tremendous pressure. Yeah, so that, that's good. Uh, we have a caller from uh, the Big Island, Michael. You're on the air. Hello. Hi. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. Thanks. You all look wonderful, I have to say. <laughs> uh, I normally wouldn't call in or say anything, but the fact of the matter is that children, children are suffering. You know, they have no control. They look to their parents as the ones who are in charge. And when their parents can't do nothing, you know, uh, you can just imagine mm -hmm. what's going through the kids' kids' minds and their hearts. <sighs> you know, uh, I'm I'm 37. I don't have any children of my own. I never been married. Uh, when I was younger, me and my brothers, we told I told my well, we said to each other, you know, before we have kids. You know, we make sure that we got everything taken care of because we don't want our children to suffer, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Well, for, for one, I like to uh, apologize for my generation to all the children because my generation has done a pretty lousy job altogether, mm. okay, as far as raising kids. So many fatherless, motherless kids out there from my generation in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it just hurts me that the kids are the ones who suffer. Yeah. Okay? That's because my generation is spoiled. Yeah. Spoiled rot. Okay, uh, could you... Uh, uh, well, the, the thing about the Israel thing, bottom right. line, to cut through the red tape, the problem is religion. The problem is religion. <clears throat> and in my own perspective, my own opinion, mm. religion is the art of control. Mm. Okay? Spirituality is the art of soul evolution. Okay. If, if for, for all these hundreds of years we've had the Catholic and the Christian, the Palestinian, the Jewish, all these guys, in all these years, where has there have been one enlightened person from these religions. Yeah. Not a one. Okay, that's... Continue. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I got your uh, point, uh, the question of religion. So let's now discuss it, and uh, if you'd like to hear uh, us uh, discussing it off the air for you, uh, would be good so that we can continue on, because we have a few more things that we got to do that I think would be of interest to you as well as other viewers. Okay, no. And we don't have uh, much time left. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I appreciate you letting yeah, me give thanks. you my uh, thanks, uh, voice on yeah. the air. Thank you. Uh, so w what I want to do before like discussing it, because this is uh, important, is to go to Jerry, another segment from Jerry Levin, yes. that um, would be helpful in discussing this. It's in accordance with the shocking sentiments expressed in one of the most celebrated of all psalms, Psalm 137, which begins innocently enough with words of historic pathos. And here are those words. By the waters of Babylon we sat down and there we wept. But Psalm 137 ends in most translations with some of the most deplorable, rage-induced, violence, revenge, rationalizing words found anywhere in Scripture. And here are those words. Happy are those who pay you back for what you have done to us. 
who take your babes and smash them against the rock. So a principal reason for going back besides getting in the way is to try to use my training and experiences as a journalist to communicate the troubling stories of terrible, violent oppression taking place daily, no, hourly, in the West Bank, taking place beneath the radar of mainstream press coverage. As an experienced journalist or just a plain old human being, I do know a lack of fair play when I see it. And I also try to communicate the terrible impact on world opinion that this failure to highlight and report has had in shaping a number of critical myths about conditions there. And that underreporting. And those myths have been crucial in discrediting the Palestinians, Christian and Muslim Palestinians struggle to live free and independent lives. And the third reason is the additional terrible effects those myths and facts on the ground are having on the tireless and devoted efforts of hundreds of thousands of Jews in Israel and elsewhere in the world who are trying along with us to help the Palestinians gain their freedom and independence from Israel's terrible oppressive yoke. Now, it is a yoke clearly running against the fitfully receding tide of Western-style inspired colonialism. See, the tragedy of militant Zionism, in my opinion, is that the founders who prevail adopt a paradigm of nation-building colonial rule that unknown to most people at the end of the 19th century was soon to go out of style. Yeah, um, we have a caller on the line, but before I get to the caller, I wanna play this uh, 42nd uh, segment from Jerry Levin because he talks about the myths and then we can go to the caller and we can discuss some more stuff. The myth of the peace process. The myth of, well, what do you expect from that part of the world? Arabs have been massacring Jews for hundreds of years. The myth of the unsuitable Palestinian partner in the so-called peace process. The myth of Zionism. The myth that all Jews support in Israel, right or wrong. And finally, the myth of the double standard. The myth of the U.S. as an honest broker in the so-called peace process. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk about those myths because some of the stuff we were talking about before. And now uh, we'll go to David uh, from Kauai. You're on the air, David. Hey, I just have a comment. First of all, I, I see what the Palestinians and the Jews have been dealing with, you know, Israelis for years and years. But I just have a comment here in Hawaii where we live. We live under an occupation, a United States occupation, and you never really hear about the Hawaiian religion anymore because it's pretty much been genocided into the shadows and darkness. Now, we have Linda Lingle, who is a Jewish person. She has really done little or nothing for us over here. If you look at the pollution issues and the lack of housing and all this, you don't really hear Israel screaming for the rights of Native Americans or Native Hawaiian. Hmm. You don't hear them talk about us at all. Um, they are speaking directly to the immigrant occupation of Hawaii. You know, so if Israel was such a wonderful, or the Palestinians were such a wonderful, loving people, and there's so many loving, wonderful Palestinian Muslims and Israeli Jews, then why do we never hear any of these wonderful, loving people saying that it's time to help the Indians? help the Native Americans, help the Native Hawaiians. I've never heard anybody speak to that issue. So I just, I, 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 you know, blessed are the peacemakers. I hope that they can work with one another. But if there's such a sincere commitment to anti-occupation and human rights, where do both of these people stand on Native Hawaiian rights and Native American rights? And I yeah. thank you for the, uh, the dialogue. 
it's, uh, it's good, David. Thanks. But uh, as a Palestinian, I tell you, uh, Palestinians stand by and with the Native American and the indigenous Hawaiian. <coughs> I can tell you that. For You can take it straight to the bank. But anyway, thank you. We have like uh, a few more minutes. And uh, what I want to do before the discussion, go to last segment from Jerry. It's also three minutes, but it has maps and so on. So we can like yeah. continue on with that. Maps. 400 of those villages inside this crescent area here, not the West Bank, which is about here, 400 of those villages no longer exist. No longer exist. The whited areas on that map tell the story. Those 400 villages were literally removed from the map in history by the Israeli army. Now let's take a look at the incredible shrinking map of Palestine another way. The first map shows how Palestinian territory, the first map on the left, was ordered split almost in half by the United Nations in 1947. Actually, 53%, this cream-colored area here, 53% to the emerging nation of Israel, and 47% the green to the Arab inhabitants. Interestingly enough, although Israel got 53%, the population at that time was about four to one, four to one Arabs to every Jew that had moved into the Holy Land or had been there, living there. And then number two, the second map, is the one that I showed you earlier. And you can see how the land area of the Palestinians was reduced by half again as a result of the 1967 Six-Day War. Now, moving right along to this map, this map here. Take a look, a close look at it. This outlines what was ge generally and shamefully reported in the summer of 2000 and ever since is Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak's generous offer to the Palestinians. Now, as you can see, you can understand why Yasser Arafat naturally refused. So the so-called generous Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, we uh, end up with 9% of all of the land of Palestine uh, given to uh, the Palestinians, perhaps uh, through unilateral action by Ehud Olmert with Kadima, and they would be encircling and taking over the Jordan Valley and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we are dealing with. But uh, as George was commenting, shocks, we haven't uh, solved the problem <laughs> <laughs> this time. And actually, we are flat out of time because if we uh, had another half hour. Yeah. We would yes, have. <laughs> all right. We probably would have uh, solved it. But anyway, thanks to our viewers. And we will be dealing with this topic uh, more. And thank you for coming. And uh, good thanks. luck. See thank you next you month. Thank us. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian.